here it goes my friends so today we're gonna start with bada bing bada boom this wonderful tool all right so i know a lot of people that play street fighter 5 are really new to the scene um and of course there are some returning players people that have played four in the past all right now a common question i always get for people is like damn zaf how do you get your footsie so good well to be honest it was just the footsie's hand guide that's literally it and then of course repetition because repetition breeds mastery right it's the precursor to mastery a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about today it's going to be very difficult to do in a match you're going to suffer your gameplay is going to be really strange because you're going to be so focused on something new your brain's not used to it right your neurons in your brain have to like come together and and get stronger at these, these new connections they're making but i promise you after like a good mm, hundred games to a thousand games you'll be able to just see a drastic improvement in your neutral play just because of this so if you bear with me and you follow along right and you just stick to it and you practice this for a good like 100 matches every 100 matches just like kind of watch your your replays right and just look back and compare the progress you'll see how much more effective you are at controlling spacing and dictating the match outside of pressure all right cuz if you can win a match without having really to fight and be like a brute and forcing your opponent to do things uh then the match comes to you a lot easier and I think that's like a true showcase of mastery, my opinion, at the very least. But so yeah, the Fitzy Hand Guide. This is what I use. This is like a really dope um, foundation if you want to strengthen your footies. Like you can take this and then you can do the things I did. Like I just took each element and I put my own spin on it, or came up with different things, add different rhythms, you know. But this is just a good start. Uh, how you're gonna start going about developing that groundwork? All right. So this website is on Sonic. It's on SonicHurricane.com. Uh, the Footsie's Handbook has been on there since August 25th. It's my brother's birthday. It's pretty funny. 2013. All right, so it's supposed to be five years in August that this has been up there. And I've I've been studying this since. Um, yeah, about I think I got introduced to this like around September of that year, maybe a little earlier. I don't know. I think this might have gotten edited actually after that um yeah most likely this guy edited after that and that's why this is like this but i'm pretty sure this has been a long around longer than that but so we're gonna begin today with the first three elements we don't really have to go into all of them we can kind of like break that down over a period of time i just want to lay down the really basic ones because in each one is like three elements so i believe there's like nine or ten in the first three chat oh yeah there's like nine and there are like rules like little exceptions or whatever but um all right so let's check this out all right so oh yeah so each chapter is gonna have like a, a set like element like a amount of concepts that you would basically want to practice all right and if you look underneath each chapter there's like a little brief summary or that you're gonna come across um and for the chapter one, it says Footsie's 101 begins with three universal concepts axiomatic, 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 axiomatic to all Street Fighter games and the fighting genre in general. So I'm assuming axiomatic means like it's pretty much applicable to uh, differing like aspects, I'm assuming. Okay, so it's like universal. Like that's why that word is there. Context clues. I, re I learned that in English. Uh, and the fighting game genre in general. Okay, so punishing with attacks, intentionally making yourself appear vulnerable, and using poke patterns to set up throws are all fundamental skills. All right. So the last the last portion of this is actually really um, overlooked. A lot of people wonder, like, how does Daigo get away with walking up full screen and throwing people? Well, it's because he establishes a pattern in an intelligent player's head. If he's playing against a certain type of player that's not really, how do you say present-minded or excuse me you're really emotional and you can kind of like f like fluster that player uh you generally don't want to do this walk up throw thing on them because they'll usually snap they'll just like at some point do something crazy but if he's playing somebody intelligent he knows he can like 
kind of plant seeds in their brain like a brain ninja he's just planting seed impregnating their brains with ideas and then that's what will help him establish the confidence to do walk up throw full screen like he's done plenty of times all right so element one let's see okay um I, mean, I guess i can just go through the whole thing let me start off with this so it says a lot of people make the mistake of assuming that footsies is something you whip up on the fly while you certainly can do it that way, and while freestyling footsies is certainly a valuable skill, the fact of the matter is that Alex Valle knows more about footsies than you'll ever know. The real problem is that you don't even know that you're supposed to know these things. That's true. Footsies as a whole is such a dynamic, complex subject that it's impossible to convey or grasp at once. Hence why I'm stressing with you guys to just kind of take it in baby steps. All right. So we're going to try something different. Let's approach footsies like a collection of situations and try to come up with elemental solutions to each scenario. Practice these one by one until you're comfortable enough with them to incorporate them fluidly into your game plan. So I like this approach because it doesn't only, it helps you in terms of like the footsies aspect. Yeah, that's cool. But it also, if you take this like kind of structured approach where you see it a case by case scenario and then you just apply and plug in elements to help you solve the problems and the riddles of neutral, it will also help you with pressure. It'll also help you with defense. Like you'll start to create like a system, you know, where you can identify things defensively and offensively and you can just kind of like plug in things like that. All right, cool. So um oh billy thank you for tuning in brandon xm thank you for tuning in. i appreciate it guys hope you guys are having a good time so far let me let me know who else is in here because i can't really see the chat unless i go over to my twitch tab and do all that nonsense but all right so element one is you momentarily step into your opponent's poke range and quickly back out instead of attacking all right so this is footsies 101 to see it in action check out mike watson's hyper fighting guile Demolishing some poor bastard. <laughs> Two consecutive full rounds of toying with his opponent's natural reactions. This bait works well in tense matches after extended periods of cautious zoning or with charge characters who rarely walk forward. Okay, so let's just watch the demonstration and then we can talk about it. And then I'm going to show you guys uh, in the game like what it's going to look like. All right. All right. So let's see how this looks. All right, so what we're trying to focus on here is just watching Mike Watson, who's playing Guile. He's an OG player. Uh, he is actually the owner of Super Arcade. So I'm pretty sure you guys remember his name or whatever. But Black Ass, thank you for tuning in. Boris, what's going on? AJ, my brother, thank you for guys for tuning in. As always, much love to you guys. All right, cool. So let's check this out. All right, so he's Guile. All right. So let's just watch what he does. He hasn't moved forward yet, right? Okay. Oh, what? That's the first time you move forward the entire set. But he's a charge character, right? So charge characters, they usually, they down back or they maintain a spacing. You know what I'm saying? So this is, this is probably why he was anticipating something. And he walks up and he just crouched and he baits the DP. All right. So let's watch it again. See if he does it again. And he baits it again. All right, so let's watch that one more time. It's a pretty fast round, so. <laughs> Walmart man, 33, whatever footsies. Is that like the foot of Cammy when she die? She does a dive kick? No, foot, it's footsies. I don't know if you're trolling or not, but regardless, I'll use this as an opportunity to, to help somebody out. But basically, footsies is just like an establishment of dominance in neutral. All right, that's basically what it is. Like you have different uh, aspects of footsies, like dashing, jumping, and stuff like that. But they're all like kind of integral to maintaining some sort of dominance all right so that's basically what footsies is, is establishing a dominance of a spacing and that's basically it you're just trying to win the spacing because that spacing is the spacing where you can just punish your opponent you can stop them from doing abusing things you can anti or you can stop them from dashing all right and when you're on the other end of that, if you're at a bad spacing, it's all about how do you deconstruct somebody's superior positioning and that's where you use these little little elements and footsies to try to like circumvent the uh, opponent's advantage and their strengths you know because you want to kind of just like crack their foundation and then the rest of the house co comes crum uh, crumbling down and so that's what footsies is all right hopefully that explains it and if you have more questions feel free to ask of course all right so let's watch this round again so just watch again gal he, he hasn't moved forward yet 
all right and when he does the ken player is expecting him to attack that's why he does the preemptive dp all right he still hasn't done it see he still hasn't done it you see right here he tried to do he tried to bait out with this with the uh with the knee right to see if it would come out but it didn't so then he walks back fireball baits it out again so you see how he had multiple ways of accomplishing that same thing he moved forward not only by moving forward on the stick but he also moved forward by using a forward moving attack so if you guys want to get really creative this is where i say incorporate your own elements is figuring out like what fu like fundamentally speaking moves forward for the character it can be a normal it can be a special it can be a taunt it can be um you know a dash it can be a jump into a position you can also uh what, what would be another one uh i think that's basically i've covered everyone but you want to figure out like fundamentally how can you move forward all right that's how you add in your own dynamic and your own uniqueness to footsies so you see how originally the first way time he moved forward he he just walked up right baits it but then he also had the the second option the second like flavorful approach you know by adding variety it's harder for the ken player to keep track of what he's trying to do because when he sees you know if he sees fireball and then he sees that sabat maybe he thinks oh or not sabat the knee whatever if he sees the knee he's like oh he's trying to attack again you know but he doesn't bite maybe because that mind game might have went over his head and that could be also why mike watson went back to doing the walk up right because the knee kind of just i don't know it could be a frame kill but it can it can be all other things on top of it of course a lot of the best players have multi-purpose behind the decisions they make they don't do thing just they don't do a thing just for one sole intention they'll like incorporate other things behind it you know joey tones what's going on brother damn it dom hyper fighting it is my man so all right there's that so that's footsie's element number one so you know how right here it was saying that this bait works well in tense matches all right so the reason why you could say it works there is because when when a match is really intense right uh Usually, both players are looking for that one opportunity, right? And I'm pretty sure you guys have done this before. Where you go in training mode, right? And you practice, like, hit confirming Karen's low forward. But for some reason, you just can't get it when you try to focus on it, right? But then, like, let's say you're casually just kind of doing it and you're just, like, really loose. You'll be able to hit it every time because your instincts are taking over. Like, it's just now it's muscle memory at that point. But when you start to focus, you hyper-focus too much, you get tunnel vision. You know, the second, like something happens like outside of an interval that you were anticipating if the rhythm is slightly off even though you knew it was coming it can still throw you off enough because you weren't 100 percent accurate all right so when when something is really intense and you know both players are looking for that opportunity like they really want to close out the game right especially in street fighter 5 they're going to be looking for that one opportunity and that's why like if somebody has v trigger one of the best things you can do is you can just walk in the max distance of that poke and then just walk right back out like like uh, mike watson was doing with guile all right so you can use this not only against dps to bait dps but you can use it against pokes you can use it to bait out fireballs you can use whatever it does but the point is this allows you to just walk into range and get information and then move right out seamlessly and there's not really much risk behind it you know somebody could use a longer poke to hit you but then you just adjust that's it you just adjust to that spacing right instead of the shorter spacing all right so the other aspect that they refer they referenced to was after extended periods of cautious zoning right that makes sense because like you've seen with the mike watson example all right both players were zoning and combine this with the third and final fact the fun fact i guess you could say of the element with charge characters who rarely walk forward you have two characters that are zoning right and so they're maintaining the spacing they're just fighting here they're just fighting here fighting here fighting here right and now all of a sudden one of those players just decides to close the ground what are you th thinking he's doing that for he's charging at you imagine if some dude just like you've never seen before just stares at you angry and he's just walking up at you like this from across the street you're like uh what the fuck like i don't know who this dude is but i think he's trying to do something to me you know what i'm saying so then you get defensive and that's the same thing that's happening there 
is that they're both zoning and then all of a sudden he shows this shift in aggression in terms of his body language and now he's moving forward it's like oh am i now I'm, especially because he's a charge character why else would he give up charge to attack me right and you can use that against them also but that's another lesson entirely okay so you guys following me so far how is this so far i need some feedback guys Word. Thanks, AJ. Cool. All right. So, element two. Um, determine which of your combos and attack strings position your opponent barely outside their effective reversal range. Okay, so determine which of your combos and attack strings position your opponents barely outside of their effective reversal range, especially when facing characters with greater mobility. So character with greater mobility would be like a Kami, it would be like a Colleen, it would be like, you know, if you're playing the other older games, it's like Yun. If you're playing, um, who else is really mobile? Valento was mobile, right? So, okay, so there you, those are the characters you'd have in mind. One of the best ways to trick someone into wasting meter and handing you the match is by making yourself appear falsely vulnerable. There's no better example of this concept than the, fi the famous final exchange of the B3 Street Fighter Alpha 2 tournament. All right, B3 was like basically, it was Evo before it was Evo. All right, all right. So we're gonna look for here are just like a, some sort of a block string that's gonna basically put the, uh, the aggressor, the, the offensive player in the situation outside of their opposing character's reversal attack, all right? So let's see. All right, so we're going to watch, I believe Valle is Sagat. All right, ready? Nice. Okay, that was really good. So you see what's going on here is um, that block string right there. I'm pretty sure he could have did more damage. Um, Yeah, he definitely could have did more damage. But he just wanted to put... Troy at the range where if he does a, a reversal super, the first hit of the super would whiff and it gives him enough time to do the DP. See? So you can do that uh, offensively. You can do that with not only reversal like, you know, supers and stuff like that or DPs, but that same concept applies against like normal attacks where because you got to think of it when somebody does something on reversal timing right? um generally it's it's a super it's a it's a it's a special move a super or like something of that nature so a lot of the times when people see reversal they just think of specials but you also have reversal time normals the difference is that you don't see reversal pop up when somebody presses a button on reversal timing you see what i'm saying so if you can actually um increase your awareness in situations like that and when you see something, if you're so alert in terms of the timing, let's say you try to come into a block string, but you got counter poked, then you know most likely that they did something at the fastest possible timing, right? Or, you know, if you do a poke and then you kind of just wait and see and you know your animation, you understand your opponent's character's animation, and you're like, oh shit, they just pressed this button at the fastest possible timing. Now you can set up strings, right? Like tight strings or whatever. Uh, that will just position you outside of range of their pokes. I used to do that a lot with Fei Long, where I would just like it. Kind of, it's like really difficult to do it in in five because they don't really have a lot of block strings that are more than like two hits, right? So like that are true strings. I'm saying like like two like three light attacks like back to back to back. There's usually there's like always some sort of gap in between one of the one of those buttons. But like, let's say in like the older games, I would do like short, 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 stand short with Faye. And it would put me right outside of most characters like crouching, um, medium punch and low forwards, right? So at that range, I would like automatically shift to whiff punish mode. Like I would just position myself at the very cusp of somebody's attack range, especially the more dominating your offense is, the greater the chance that your opponent's going to take a risk to turn the tides against you. 
So, you know, the better my offense was, the, the, the better my spacing became because the opponent sitting on the other side was actually losing discipline as the set went on, right? So you can think of that like that. You don't have to just think of reversals as uh, special attacks, but you can think of it as buttons too. So if you can learn how to block string yourself in a way that would position you outside of their counter pokes, then that is uh, really optimal in terms of creating that lockdown type of corner pressure. You know, because with footsies, you can apply these concepts in the corner also. It's actually even better in the corner because your opponent can't move out of the range unless they move forward. They can't move back because the wall's there. They can get a little bit skinnier because they're standing, but they can't really move out of the range. You dictate the range unless they move forward, which is a risk in and of itself. All right. Black Acid says, I think that's the best way to shimmy personally. Set up with the normal that makes them throw with no walk back necessary. Yeah, for sure. All right. Um, so let's see. Okay, so we already see, we've seen the example for number two. Now we'll go to element number three. So once you've established a pattern of poking consistently at a certain range, use your opponent's hesitation to walk up and throw them. It's always dangerous to wander into enemy attack space, so wait until you're certain you've trained them to think twice about pushing buttons. John Choi CVS2 Sakura does an excellent job of demonstrating the, this principle for the entire first round of that EVO, EVO 2K7 match, 2007. There's no way he would have gotten away with such gutsy, gutsy throw attempts at the beginning of the round. Hmm. Okay. All right, so this is basically talking about establishing a fake pattern. If you've ever come across the Bruce Lee, there was like a quote where he talks about fake rhythm, like breaking your rhythm. That this is basically what it's pertaining to is being able to break your rhythm, you know, and and just and just insert new actions that your opponent is not anticipating, you know. Okay, so we're gonna see this example right here. This is a really dope one. I really, I actually really like this one. There's no timestamp on it. Okay. Oh yeah, it's towards the beginning of the round. Is it the beginning of the round? I think it's round one. Let's see. I haven't watched this in years though. All right, see the roundhouse? That's the main poke where he's trying to dictate that space. So he's just trying to convince the Yori player, like, hey, I'm, when I walk in this range, I'm going to press roundhouse. See? All right. See, so he's he's winning, even though he's not always hitting with the roundhouse, he's winning because of the influence of the roundhouse. Of course, he has the health lead and all that good jazz, too, but... See that? <laughs> that was so good, man. That was really, really good. I'm gonna rewind that last, like, 15 seconds of it. That was so good. I love seeing stuff like this. See, when you see somebody whiff it like that, and you know their spacing's on point, but they're doing it from far away. So, like, that one hit, right? But you see how he kind of just does it right there? Um, this could mean one of two things. One, it could mean that the opponent's not aware of their pushback spacing. So, obviously, when you get hit, right? It's like against Dalsim. If you get hit, you're going to get pushed back a certain amount of range, right? This is every character, of course. Um, so if they whiff like right away, it can tell you like they might not be that great with their spacing in terms of pushback. All right. So they could be great in terms of like maintaining the spacing, but their pushback spacing isn't that great. Or what it could mean is that he's trying to convince you that he's going to keep attacking that spacing. So that means there's an ulterior motive there. So anytime you see something like that, where it's like, I know you're strong enough as a player to know that I'm not in range of this unless I move forward. All right. So if you see that, you can ask yourself like right away, like, what is this ulterior motive? And then that's when you can wait. You can sell him the idea like, I'm going to sell you the idea and I want you to buy into it that, you know what? I'm going to stop. I'm not going to I'm not going to press anything in this range because I keep getting hit by roundhouse. But in actuality, you're really trying to see what the hell he's trying to do behind all these roundhouses. 
all right and then that way you can avoid situations like this at least to the best of your ability all right so especially like when you go back like there are a bunch of subtle clues in terms of the opponent's body language that tell you like what they're thinking of what their motives are so like you see this right we'll go back a little bit you see how he started walking back he wasn't really walking back like that right so for him to walk back and then just start like kind of shimmying in place that that could tell you right there and then like all right he, he has something up his sleeve all right and we're gonna get into like one of the elements coming up talks about that all right so that's how he sets that up which is really dope hope you guys are enjoying this so far i'm having this is this is awesome i really like this and it's like a, a nice little fun one which is like you know every once in a while hide underneath the table <laughs> That's funny. So, all right. Those are the first three elements. All right. So, let's get into part two. All right, guys. Any questions so far? Please feel free to ask. Because I'm here for you guys, of course. So, there's no use of me going on if you guys are still confused. Asking you're good. You're good. I know AJ is already good. Yo, that ground game was godlike. <laughs> What's up, Reese? Thank you for tuning in, by the way, bro. Oh my god. I can't. Uh, listen, I can't do such a thing. AJ is loyal to the soil. You see, he's like constantly in my streams. I can't do that. All right, so we go to chapter two. So it says, it takes a long time to look through enough footage to find clear examples of these concepts, but I'll try to continue this series on a weekly struggle, uh, schedule as long as I'm able. Hopefully you got a chance to practice some of the lessons covered in last week's installment and found a place for them in your game plan. Here are a few more pieces. Yeah, see, so this was definitely a lot older. I had a feeling that this was edited because I was like, damn, I'm pretty sure I've seen this before 2013, but yeah, so this is like years old. Okay. Anyways, so element number four. When your opponent is looking to punish your standard pokes, try whiffing a crouching light kick a few pixels outside of their sweep range. If they, or not just sweep range, but their longest poke, reaching poke, all right? Uh, if they mistake it for a slower attack, they'll leave themselves open with their counter when their counter attack misses. Be ready to punish the whiff or simply walk up and throw them during their recovery period. This tactic works best during mirror matches and against opponents who can hit your medium pokes on reaction. Hmm. Okay. All right, so let's go into this. So if somebody is... Okay, so anytime I get into a range, said range, and my opponent is like anticipating that I'm always gonna press a button, right? This is basically what, what this looks like. So let's say, at this spacing, this is where crouching medium kick whiffs. All right? Right here. Like, if you look at the... Well, I'd have to actually make that a lot smaller. But if you look at the front of our toes... Damn, this, I can't even make this. Oh, there you go. Right there. So that spacing right there, these two squares, two pixel squares, like I'd say 0.2 squares, this is where crouching medium kick whiffs, all right? And if I move any closer, it hits, right? Look, it hits, right? So if you are so aware of your opponent's spacing, you just know like they'd have to enter that range to hit you standing. Like if I'm standing, you have to be this close, right? Okay. So in knowing that, if I know that my opponent is uh trying to maintain this range and they're trying to whiff punish me right granted that's not lo chun's longest poke but let's pretend it is 
if I know that my opponent's looking for that, there are ways I can go about tricking him into whiffing. So, the one that we just encountered was this one. Well, let's say I'm here, right? Now, I'm going to walk in and I'm going to crouch. All right? Cool. And now, I'm going to walk in. And I'm going to walk back out. So let's say right here, okay. Right? So at this range, they walk up and they're just blocking. All right, you, you generally don't want to block in footsies because a couple of things happen. All right, so I'm gonna go off course for a little bit. But this is why you do not want to block unless there's intention behind blocking. All right, so you generally want to stand because of this. So I'm gonna turn this to normal. I'm gonna turn this to normal. Turn this to normal, turn this to normal. All right. I gotta reset it. All right. It's right about here, okay. So if you look at if you look at the V gauge, right? Let me move out of the way. Let me just boop. So if you look right over here where I was, right? If you look at the Chun-Li, she is gaining bar, but at the cost of gray health, right? And I'm also gaining more bar because on block, I'm getting more than she is. All right. If you look, I'm going to get EX before she does. So look at that. She barely got over half of a bar and I'm already at one full bar. Okay, so she's like at like 60% bar, I'd say. But not only that, she got all of that grade uh, damage, especially in this game. So that's something you want to keep in mind, right? So you don't want to crouch because of that. It, it, it makes it makes it so it's a lot easier for me to hit you. Um, so, right, let's say... Let's say Chun, uh, this whiff's right here, right? But if I make her crouch, see how it hits? That's why you want to stand like if you're gonna if you're going to crouch it's mostly for information or to convince or influence your opponents like focus into trying to strike you all right and then through deceptive tactics like you're learning in today's session that's where you'd walk in the range and stand up last second instead of crouching like you usually do or any sort of like variable that gets introduced all right so the reason why you don't want to really crouch in footsies is because you're going to be giving your opponent meter and on top of that you're you'll be fatter so like let's say if i'm playing a fireball character right like uh um, like chun yeah let, let's let's do this this is actually perfect look at how much bar i'm getting well let me make her all block all block crouching I'm getting a lot more bar because of that, right? So I'm getting the the, the super buildup from from my low forward on block and the special cancel. But the thing is, is if, th if this whips, my special does not come out because I'm trying to OS it. Otherwise, if if it always came out like this by accident, then I would just wait for my opponent to whiff the button and I would just jump every time. But the smarter players know that they option select this, so they buffer it. So this does not come out unless I make contact with you, right? So that will not come out unless I make contact with my opponent, all right? 
So you're gonna see in this example, you're gonna see that when, uh, I don't know exactly who this is that's fighting, but whoever the player is, I guess we'll find out. Let me see, let me click on this. You're gonna see them walk into the range and then whiff a light kick, all right? Because it looks like on startup, it's very similar to a crouching medium kick especially when you're looking for like any sort of twitch you're not gonna be able to differentiate it you're just gonna be like oh he twitched and i'm looking for this press a button nah right so let's watch this look at that so you see that like this whole time the sagat player is Throwing fireballs, throwing fireballs, and he's just whiffing. And he... And he whiffs the crouching light. So now he's introducing feints. And then he doesn't do anything. So he just walked up into the range where he was doing the fireball. And he sold him the idea that he was going to do fireball. So you notice, like, he started to increase his delays over time. He was, like, doing it more and more and more and more and more. Alright, so let's watch this again. Because you notice when he was in the corner, that's when he was doing fireball, right? He knows he has super. That, that crossing light kick right there, that crossing light kick, was that was information. That was telling him that he is trying to bait something. So when you see something like this, you're going to see another way to, co to counter that coming up. But that right there is an indicator that he is trying to bait something or he's trying to defuse a situation. All right, and there's the situation he's trying to defuse is getting rid of this super. He's trying to use his bar like it's his own bar. So he's like, how can I get this bar walk player to use that bar? I know. I'm going to fake fireball. See, crouching like kick again. Look at that. That was really good. And time's running down too. That was really good. Word. Okay. Um let's see. All right. Oh, yeah, see, this is like what I was telling you guys about earlier. It's how you can, like, space yourself outside of, of um, attacks. Right? Look at that. Wow, that was really good. So after this, uh, what is that, the swing blow low or some shit like that? It put him outside of the spacing of low forward. So he whiffs the jab just to, to bait because he knows he's looking for some sort of poke to counter poke and get space and establish his offense because he's down a lot on health, right? So he has to start somewhere. And he uses the opportunity to walk up and throw him on the whiff punish. Especially when, like, an opponent's down like this, they already think of whiffing as, like, oh, shit, I fucked up. Let me go back to not overcommitting, and then that allows you to walk up and throw, especially if you have a really good walk speed. All right. So what else? Um, do, 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 do. So this tactic works best against me. Okay, okay, cool. So element five. Um, hmm. So, oh yeah, actually let me show you guys a quick example with Chun-Li because I have this up right now. Let's do this. So I'll set up two recordings, all right? So it's gonna be this, walk up, and walk back out. Okay. 
See? And that whiffed. So, if... This is obviously kind of hard to do with a computer. So I'm trying to make it look like as realistic as possible for you guys. But, let's say if I do... Let me see. Let's say I do this. Or actually, no. Let's say this spacing. I walk up. I do that. See? And I'm blocking too. So when you start to learn like your hitboxes and your hurtboxes and stuff like that, that stuff's really important too because then you'll be able to increase the chances of whatever footsie concept you're trying to emulate of that working because you're learning how to evade their attacks and you're learning how to poke them without getting hit and little things like that. Those little victories add up to big victories over time in a matchup. So that's why it's always important to do your research. Understanding how slow a button is, how fast it is on startup, the recovery, if it's negative on block, this, this, and that. What are the hitboxes, the hurtboxes, you know? Because you have three ways of, uh, of countering a move. It's either on startup, you beat it when it's active by being evasive, or through priority. You guys know that's that's a common thing in Street Fighter V. Um, and the lastly, you beat it on its recovery frames. So you either beat it on block or on width, all right? So you simplify it. You're like, oh, if I have a hard time with this button, say you have a hard time with with Abigail's stand light kick or stand light punch, crouching light punch, crouching light punch. That's the one where he hits twice. If you have a hard time with that button, you say, well, can I be on startup? And if you can, you look into that. Okay, well, if I can't be on startup, can I avoid it and hit it? Or can I take advantage of priority? Is that likely? You look at the hitboxes, you study that. Okay, uh, what about on recovery? Is it really laggy? Can I whiff punish it easily? Yes or no? And then you decide from there, like, okay, I'm gonna go with this option most likely followed by these two in this order in terms of like most likely to least likely all right cool so now we have element number five all right so let's see again guys feel free to ask me any questions uh if if you're enjoying it let me know keep the steam running let's let's do it now i meant steam not stream like steam like choo choo you know all right so element five, if your opponent starts overusing the feint explained above, where, you know, they walk in and walk out or whatever, or they walk in with a light, uh, you take a step, a quick step forward and attack with your strongest combo in sync with their rhythm. Light attacks may be fast, but they're certainly not immune to mind games. Mike Watson is known for making excellent use of such fakes, but Onuki's 3S Chun, third strike, found a way to make him pay. Right. Well, you have to, if your opponent's clearly out footsing you, you have to figure out, like, is it realistic in that span, in that match? Let's say it's a tournament setting. Is it realistic for you to, to uh, overcome that by beating their footsies with footsies? If not, that means that you don't know, you know, the spacing of the buttons. You're not really sure with the hitbox and interactions. At that, in that point, you don't want to play a war that you cannot win. That's art of war shit. So you're going to want to take your battle to where your strength is, you know what I'm saying? So then you would go and resort to the other areas of your game that you are strongest at, all right? Because you don't want to play into a weakness in a tournament setting unless you're intentionally trying to learn something, you know what I'm saying? In that case, that's really good, but not many people are have the, the guts to do that, you know? And guts, the acronym for guts is get uncomfortable to succeed. If you can do that, then by all means do it, all right? Cool, so let's look at this example right here. So this is Mike Watson showing how he punishes people that like to fake fake um, buttons against him. Oh shit, gotta reload that. Whoops. Do that again. I'm 
I'm pretty sure we missed this. Where, where the hell is it? Oh, okay, okay, okay. I see what they're saying. So, th what they're saying is that this is an example of how Mike Watson tends to do this a lot, right? Which is like fate, fainting the light attack and then luring out a button and whiff punishing it. All right? So, look at this. Watch this. Ready? So, he whiffs the crouching short. All right? So, let's watch that again. This time, I'm going to do it like frame by frame. All right. So, he neutral jumps. He lands. He does light kick. And he baits. And he punishes it. All right? Now, in the next video, we're going to see Nuki punish that. So, that's why they linked that. All right? So, let's... So, so you see that how he caught him in sync this is like a, a very challenging skill to learn but i really like i cannot stress how important it is to really push yourself to the upper echelon in a fighting game is right is rhythm recognition so like watch if you look at this right he was so on his rhythm look at that what dude that's insane like he just knew Look at that. So, like, I don't know what prompted him to believe that he was going to do that. Maybe Watson had a habit of walking forward, walking back, then walking forward and attacking. You know, like, a fake walk forward, a walk back, and then a real walk forward. Maybe that was the rhythm that he gave him, and then he's like, I know this is the fake walk forward, and this is the real walk forward, right? So, maybe that's what it was, and he caught him right there. He caught him on his low, low short. So, being aware of somebody's, like, faints... Like, that is how you could punish them. Oh, see, he's trying to hit him. He's trying to hit his feints again. So that was really, that was cool. Oh, I'm, gu I'm guessing you guys dig the acronym. Have guts. All right, cool. So that's element five. So element six is always be on the lookout for changes in your opponent's behavior, especially when they gain access to super meter. When people start edging back and forth at mid range, that's a sign they're fishing for something to nail with the super. Remember what Daigo Street Fighter 4 Ryu did to Punko at Capcom's international exhibition? Stick to quick normals to quick normal moves in that situation. Don't test their reactions with slow specials, special moves. Or better yet, lock them into blocks and then bait the super from a deceptively safe distance. Alright, so this one's really dope. Alright. So we're basically going to see how... You're going to see how Punko like, kind of shifts because he has access to super and how Daigo takes advantage of it. Alright? Oh, well, he doesn't have super. He has ultra here. So this is the shift. Alright, so let's bring this back a little bit so that was really good so if you're if you're not like okay so we're watching this from the perspective of daigo right so daigo's punishing him by using his ultra meter all right so you're seeing Daigo's body language kind of... It, it shifts to this, like, counter play style, you see? He's moving in place. He's swaying. He's taking the throw. All right, he's playing really defensive. And he's playing at this range where it makes him really easy, easy for him to react. So he's basically just trying to close the match out by taking advantage and leveraging Punko's, um, I, I guess, like, his eagerness. See? And you can see him slowly buffering right after the tech, right? So watch this. Just watch the rhythm. Just watch the swing. You see? So right there, if Punko was like really alert and asked himself, like, why is he moving back? Why is he so cautious right now? See? He's just swaying. He's buffering. That right there, that crouch? Crouch. Why would you crouch from that far? You're not blocking a sweep. There's not a sweep that that's that hits that far. You know, you're not playing against Dalsum. So what is your reason for crouching there? So that is an automatic indicator like he's buffering, especially if he's moving in place like this at a range where it's really easy for him to react to fireball. All 
All right. So this next example is to show you how you use the block stun aspect. Because uh, you could just use, you know, your quick light attacks to try to bait. Like if he, if he knew Daigo was looking for that, he can use light attacks to bait him or move into a range where Daigo kind of gets antsy and he, he completely forgets about the super strategy, you know, because you could do something else to just take him away from that strategy and then go back to your strategy of throwing fireballs really quickly. That's what Daigo's really good at in zoning is that he sees what you're trying to do and he pulls you away, your focus away from being anti-fireball. And then when he senses you've shifted from anti-fireballs, he's like, back to fireballs, fireball, 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 over and over and over and over and over again. You know what I'm saying? So you're going to see here, like, I'm pretty sure this is Sakura that does. Let's see. Oh, that, that's this video. Oh, it's the same video. Okay. So this is the block stun element. See? That was really good. So that was Daigo that did that. You see how he used the he used the spacing? I, my bad, I keep forgetting to put it on full screen. Alright? But you see that spacing, he knows like if I throw a fireball because of the because of the um I guess the advantage at that range. If he's not committing right away to ultra, he's not going to he's not gonna punish. So Punko probably throughout the set was doing a lot of buffers and hiding behind like his motion his motions behind the, the attack. Because if you see him do a cross and medium punch, you can't tell that he's buffering, right? Like you can't tell. So because he does a cross and medium punch first, it's killing all of the opportunity that, that he has to do the uh ultra at the fastest possible timing like just reacting and then going through the fireball so that's why he's safe all right so what you could do is you can use your block strings and understanding of advantage to trap people with like certain strings or whatever and then whatever like uh reversal attempts they're attempting with their super you'd be out of range you'd block in time all that good stuff all right it's a lot harder to trap people in Street Fighter V if you don't have a fireball. Um, with, like, you know, spacing, like, type moves and stuff like that. Um, but it's still possible. It's just something that you have to dig really deep creatively to discover on your own. But it's still possible. Guile can still do it, of course. Guile is really strong in the game for that reason, that he can trap people. But it still exists. All right, Cody might be the next character that can do that also. All right, so let's see. And this last one, this is the, these are the last three we're gonna go over. All right, so this segment focuses, which is chapter three, on the massive advantages gained by cornering your opponent. As you may have noticed, the capacity to safely and stealthily withdraw from an opponent's attack space is a crucial aspect of footsies. Backing your opponent against a wall negates their ability to walk backward, giving you sole control over when you're in and out of attack range. All right. So this is just building upon the ideas that we discovered and talked about earlier. Uh, corner game, it amplifies the strengths of your footsies elements from before. All right. So just think of it like that. Basically, anytime you learn something in neutral, it's like two times stronger in the in the corner because now that you have the corner is like a second player that hops on the screen and they kind of just like push they push your opponent they're like oh no you got to stay in the circle and fight him you know and they're like oh shit i can't run away like damn yeah so that's that's the metaphor that's what the corner does all right so i like that the capacity to safely and stealthily draw withdraw from an opponent's attack space that's really that's really good it's all about deception right all right, so element seven, whenever you knock someone into the corner, establish a safe position slightly outside their reach. Then as soon as you get the feeling they're about to, they're about to advance or let their guard down, step forward and poke their toes with a low medium kick. Getting hit by one of these gives a lot of players the urge to retaliate with one of their own. Simply let it whiff, then strike their extended limb. Or like earlier that they showed you with the example, you can throw them back, right back into the corner where you can just walk up and throw them. All right. However, keep in mind that veteran players often take a step forward before counterpoking, so you might want to give them a little bit extra room. 
All right, so that goes into what I was talking about earlier. Like when, if you can identify the skill player, the skill set of the player, you can tell if something is a genuine, like they are ignorant to this or they're really weak in this department of footsies or there's an ulterior motive. All right, so let's show examples. So this is somebody pressuring and then allowing the poke to whiff and they just strike the extended hurt box. All right, right there, boom. That was really good. That was a roundhouse, Cammy's roundhouse. All right, let's see. Let's look at that again. Nice. Again. Nice. So you see, you see how he got hit by by the low forward. He got hit by it right here. He got hit by it right there. All right, and then he just counter poked like instinctively. It's kind of like that eye for an eye attitude. A lot of players that have the eye for an eye attitude, they will do that. So that's something you want to keep in in, uh, in the back of your head. All right. You see how he immediately like jumped right after too. That's the eye for an eye. He he got hit twice in a row and he's increasing his his risk taking like back to back. All right. So let's see. So the other option was you throw them right back to the corner. Let's see. Ah, uh, this is old school. This one's really good. This is dope. Nice. See? Simple. Simple, but you guys get it? See that? Nice. That was really good. Did he walk up when he did it? Yeah, he walked up. Wow, look at that. That was so subtle. You see that? He got hit. He got hit here. Walked up and did it. Saw he overextended, and he just he just was like, okay, I'm gonna chill. Gets thrown. I played Takamura in a set. I played Takamura at a combo breaker in a set. First of five, right? He was up two zero against me in first of five, and then he, I noticed he was doing this against me, and I was like, oh shit, he's doing he's doing this like uh walk up you know like low forward type of thing against me in certain strings, right? So what I started doing was. It was at, at, at zone two, whenever I'd create that spacing, he'd walk up and low forward me whenever I was negative, right? So what I started doing was I'd start using different negative buttons to do the same thing so he would never catch on to what I was doing. You guys see what I'm saying? So instead of me using stand fierce, one time I would use stand medium kick, another time I use low forward, but I'd still accomplish the same thing. The frame data might be a little bit different, but it's so different visually that if you're not aware of what's happening, if you can't just go to the skeleton of the game and see the situation for what it is instead of like the skin you know you're, you're you're giving too much details that's how you get confused so if because he wasn't seeing that he just saw different buttons he's thinking it's a different situation every time i literally just walked back and whiff punished him over and over and over and over again and i just kept punishing him oh, and i won five straight i beat him five two because of that you know and i was just like oh word nice cool you know like that's what these type of things do especially in a game like street fighter 5 if you have that advantage like one advantage you can snowball it into something big and take mat you could take rounds matches sets you know what i'm saying exhibitions just off of like one tiny detail that your opponent is just gleaming over okay so element eight shortly after succeeding with a typical tick throw setup repeat a similar sequence except step backward instead of executing the throw if you catch your opponent's tech attempt one thing respond with a damaging combo so this is basically like you know, like shimmies. Everybody learned element eight because, you know, Street Fighter Five. All right. So imagine how many other elements people don't learn because they're just stuck on what everybody else is doing. This is why you got to do your own research. The corner severely limits your opponent's options for escaping throws, thereby forcing them to take greater risks. They're certainly not going to walk out of your throw range, so they have to do something proactive to avoid dying to simple throw loops. But having nowhere to go also makes them an easy combo target when they get baited. All right. Let's see. Just gonna see a tick throw. Nice. Cross that again. Jab, jab, walk up throw. Drop in short, stand jab, and he bases it. Nice. That was really good. And it's good because he he already whiffed the the stand jab from before. You see how this is a completely different string. 
You whiff that stand, that second stand jab. And then he uses it against him. So it was really similar. All right. Okay. So element nine, following a basic combo or block string, poke with a light attack from its maximum distance. The corner will ensure your attack doesn't whiff, so you'll lose nothing if they continue blocking. On the other hand, if they happen to press a button, yours will usually come out sooner and stuff whatever they were trying to do. Most everyone's natural reaction to having their attack interrupted is to block, which makes it easy to walk up and throw them in their moment of hesitation. Some people have a habit of jumping instead, which can also be punished with an uppercut on reaction. This is also true. The same set. Nice. That was really nice. All right, let's rewind that. I'm gonna watch it two or three more times. So you see right here, he hits him with a crouching light punch on his roundhouse, walks up and throws him. Especially when you try to accomplish something, but it doesn't go as, as uh, intended or as planned, that can kind of just distort reality for a second. You're like, wait, what? And that is just enough time for somebody to lose track and just focus on the past. You're just, you're luring them into the past. Their attention is now on something that already happened and you're still in the present. By the time they realize what's going on, you're walked up and you already threw them. Yeah, that's a bit, that is a crush counter in Street Fighter Five. You're, you're right, but there are some there are some um, there are some light attacks that can counter poke crush counters. You just have to know the hitbox hurtbox interaction. If you're like on point, you can beat it, and your spacing has to be on point too. But that's the thing is like you have to be way more disciplined than the opponent throwing out the rush the roundhouse. You know what I'm saying? But it's still important to know that stuff because that way you can kind of neutralize their chances of making that comeback. All right, so generally speaking, there are two approaches to corner offense. Either you can press the advantage and rush them down, armed with the confidence that your pokes aren't going to whiff, or you can hold your ground and counter their every attempt to escape the corner, waging a battle of attrition which heavily favors whoever, whoever the corner benefits. So this is like the rush down, right? They're walking up, and they're just poking, a lot of poking. Nice. So this is rushdown. Rushdown doesn't always have to be throw and you know frame traps. All right. So let's go back. Do so you see this aggression? A lot of pokes, maintaining a range, not really moving back unless it's to maintain a range, right? Yeah, rich boy, of course, brother, you know it. And thank you for tuning in, of course. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it on my uh, YouTube channel afterwards. All right, so this is going to be the more defensive option. This is boss, I believe. Boss is probably playing... Is he playing Nash? Yeah, he's playing Nash. All right. So he's just kind of creating a wall. He's just like, all right, I'm going to just try to keep you here, you see? He's not... This, this, all this stuff is nice and fancy, but he's really, really just trying to take advantage of him trying to get out of the corner. Nice, see? Nice. See? All of that, like, the, the idea is not to convert from the buttons, but it's to just impose and just keep him confined into a certain area. Whereas the rush down soccer was trying to land damage and just, like, rush down, really impose and be really forceful. This Nash is just, like, it looks like he's doing the same thing, but his intentions are on punishing the movement that's fought that's gonna come after the buttons. All right? That's why he was so ready for this. All right? So you can choose. You can decide whichever flavor you want. And that's the beauty of fighting games. Even a Street Fighter V, even though it's more geared towards offense, you still have that option. So with that being said, guys, thank you guys for tuning in.